All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I, my name is Jenny McFarland. I am the bird conservation biologist for the Tucson Audubon Society, uh, co-runner of the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program, uh, program for the state of Arizona, which we'll talk about in a moment, and uh, the coordinator of the Elegant Trogon Survey of Southeast Arizona. I do have Olia with me here, Olia uh, Weekly, who's going to be, who's also on staff for the Tucson Audubon Society in the Conservation Department who will be assisting this uh, talk today. So this is a discussion of the results and data of the 2022 Elegant Trogon Survey of Southeast Arizona. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So the Elegant, the Elegant Trogon Survey is, I always been thinking of it lately as the flagship survey of the Arizona important bird areas program, often referred to as the IBA program. So the Arizona IBA program is part of a larger program. So this is actually a global uh, thing where we have like, like 178 countries that participate. The global program is spearheaded by uh, Bird BirdLife International out of the United Kingdom. And they sort of select a group to run the program this like sort of smaller program within each country. So in the United States, it's run by the Audubon Society, National Audubon. And then National Audubon decided to break it down by state. So there are state level programs as well. So the Arizona Important Bird Areas Program is headed up by the Tucson Audubon Society as well as Audubon Southwest. So it's very uh, structured, sort of uh, multi-tiered, multi-leveled program. But anything we do with Arizona IBA contributes to this larger uh, United States effort, and then from there into the larger global international effort. So the purpose of the IBA program is to discover and then designate the most critical habitats for maintaining populations of uh, native birds all over the world. So they definitely have different priorities where some IBAs are very, very high level since they're excellent habitat for birds that are you know critically threatened or even near extinction. Some of the IBAs in other countries that are like way out, you know, like small islands, IBAs just have some of the last populations of these birds that are about to go extinct, that, that sort of high level IBA stuff. But the Arizona program is incredibly robust, has a huge number of volunteers that help. We, I had to calculate all this out recently, so I can tell you, we have on every, any given year, we have well over 150 volunteers helping with IBA projects in Arizona alone. And over the last 10 years, it's been well over 500 different people that have helped with Arizona IBA work. So it's really a very robust program. And we could not do this work without the, the generous support of Arizona Game and Fish. So Arizona Game and Fish is the main funder for this program that really helps uh, Tucson Audubon and Audubon Southwest keep this uh, program going and keeping it so robust. So this is our website. If you go to aziba.org, um, this is a website specifically for Arizona IBA. We got lots of cool stuff in here. We have information and profiles about each of the IBAs in Arizona. We have some maps too showing where they are. We have some conservation resources here on this main tab. It's got some of the publications we've created. And the main one that a lot of the volunteers use is this tab called survey resources. So from here, we have all the different projects that are going on with Arizona IBA. So Bluebird, Nest Box, Elf Owl Surveys, which we do every uh, April, Gilded Flicker Surveys, Desert Purple Martin Project, and then keep on going. We've got some winter stuff that'll be coming up soon. And then also the Elegant Trogon Survey. So I'm gonna click on that. And this is how you navigate to any of the sort of public facing information that I'm gonna show today. Okay, so on here, we have a little description of what's going on with Trogon Surveys. Um, this was very important place for organizing the surveys as they were happening. Um, we had a lot of challenges starting in 2020 with doing these surveys, but we did manage to continue to do every single survey from 2013 to 2022. We did not have an interruption of surveying in 2020, which was due to the dedication of our amazing volunteers, as well as having this website available to use to organize everything digitally and online. So that's become a really important resource starting at 2020, where uh, we have 
we made pages for each of the the five elegant trail ground surveys that happened to make the entire survey effort for Southeast Arizona. It's five separate surveys. These are the dates that happened in 2022. So we just had sort of organizing pages of uh, showing the maps and we did online meetings and put the recordings here, maps of where the routes are. So it takes a lot of effort to do these surveys. And I know anyone who's helped with these surveys certainly knows that it's a lot of coordinating, a lot of communication back and forth, and then um, a lot of effort on the part of the surveyors. You guys have to be familiar with the calls. We have like an article here, like a, a scanned pages from a book on what the different calls that Trogons make, what how you can maybe interpret those in the field. But anyway, so it's quite a lot of work. And then uh, we have been putting since 2017 detailed results of each year's survey are on this website. So from this page, this Elegant Trogon page from within survey resources, if you scroll to the bottom, there's sort of pages you can link to one for each year of data. So the one for 2022 uh, has been recently published. And uh, here's a map, here's like a, a, a link to the larger map. And we'll look at the full screen map uh, a little bit later, but here's a link to the, the map showing where we had Trogon. So the way we do our Trogon surveys, the data is incredibly spatial. So we have people record information about the exact coordinates of where they encounter Trogon. So it gets very, uh, maps can be an excellent way to look at this data and make sure we're not missing information or counting the same Trogon twice, that sort of thing. So maps are very, very helpful there. And then I just have sort of a summary of each of the five mountain ranges, all the different routes surveyed and what they found. But to get to this straightforward um, presentation of the data, quite a lot is involved. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to show you guys that. So here's the spreadsheet from the Google form. So everyone who participated in the survey used a Google form, which is like an online survey to enter their data. This was another thing we had to change in 2020 that's ended up being really quite effective I think quite helpful because before we used to have a meeting point and everyone, people sometimes had to rush to get there. And it was very, doing it online, the data entry, I think has been a good change, a good innovation. So um, this is what the data looks like coming in raw. So this is straight from the Google form. It's, it's pretty well organized because um, it just sort of organized itself by column, but there's a lot of situations here when you look at a huge amount of data like this like how many lines is this so it's 80 80 lines of data coming in now each of these lines of data is one person's data entry survey because how this works is it's not if they found multiple trogons it repeats going left to right okay so you can get quite a lot of data going left to right and once we um organized it so that it was well that's not what i want yeah, once we organized it so that it was uh, going where everything, here we go for the map. So it's a lot. There's a lot of data that has to be coordinated. As information comes in, not everything is uniform just because different people are doing it different ways. And that's totally reasonable. But one of the main things that always takes some interpretation is the way that coordinates come in. So right here, you can see coordinates just looking at it quickly coordinates are coming in in different ways and sometimes it's just a, it's a it's a, literally a description at the parking lot so we gotta go get those coordinates this is metric this is utms which is totally fine we can use that no problem but it takes um some organization and conversion of data to get it into the format that the mapping will accept i had a lot of help from a very awesome and dedicated volunteer tim helen jarris did some help with this getting these coordinates uniform so that we could then put them into um, the map. So all this fiddling of data and sort of sometimes communicating back and forth with surveyors to make sure we have it correct um, leads to this lovely looking spreadsheet here. Look how nice, so organized and nice. So this is each of the, the five mountain ranges where we surveyed in the month of May of 2022. So we did the Atascosa Highlands first. This is each of the routes. This is what they had. We did find a little bit of double counting 
in here. And this is where the mapping really helps. You can see that these two trogons are really close together. The surveyors saw them at times that were similar, that kind of thing really, really helps. So we, we, we look for that sort of thing to make sure we have an accurate count. Um, we do put a little bit, sometimes a little bit of data gets entered in that was submitted via eBird, but wasn't necessarily part of the coordinated survey, but it's definitely new data. And within a couple of days, we will add that in. Um, so this, we had the Anascosas, then the Patagonias. These are all the routes. And so it goes pairs, males, females, unknowns, juveniles. And then we have sort of a note section. And then the people, we keep very careful track of the people now, because if we ever publish this data, we want to do a really thorough thank you section. And then uh, the Santa Rita's, a lot of routes in the Santa Rita's, Huachuca's, a lot of routes in the Huachuca's. That's our biggest Sky Island by far. Well, it's now the Chiricahuas are both quite large, but Huachuca's is the biggest survey, most routes, highest count. So 51 total trogons in 2022. That's, that's really interesting. That's good. That's really interesting. And then uh, Chiricahuas, a lot of routes, 14 trogons. So that's up actually from the past. So this is how the data ends up looking. So nice and organized. Now, unfortunately, I can't put tables like this easily onto the web. That's why that serve that page of 2022 Trogon data shows it sort of almost like a narrative, like a written narrative. And it's because it's really tricky to put tables like this onto the web and have it look okay for everyone looking at it. So we just decided to do it that way. But I do have this all in a lovely little spreadsheet. Now, every year I add to this larger spreadsheet. So this is the one that that showcases all the data we've done. So 2013 was the first year that Tucson Audubon joined into coordinating this survey. Before that, it had been done in the Chiricahuas and the Huachucas for a very long time, since like the late 70s, Rick Taylor in the, the portal area of the Chiricahuas had been coordinating surveys, especially of the Chiricahuas, especially of South Fork of the Chiricahuas, and sometimes the Huachucas too, pretty consistently for many decades. But in, in 2012, I was speaking with Rick and we came to the conclusion that it would be a good idea to expand that survey into other mountain ranges like the San Ritas, the Patagonias and the Atascosas with Arizona IBA's help and specifically Tucson Audubon's help. Um, this is by far, far, far the largest breeding population of elegant trogons in the United States or is in Southeast Arizona. It's pretty much the only consistent breeding population. You do get elegant trogons sometimes in extreme Southwest New Mexico, which is ecologically very similar to Southeast Arizona. And you sometimes get them in South Texas, but they're not really consistent breeding ranges. This is an abs even in the most droughty year, which we'll talk about, um, we still had elegant trogons breeding in Southeast Arizona. This is by far the most reliable and largest population of these birds in the US. So it's really pretty important that we monitor them and keep track of what's going on. And it's been a really fun project of Arizona IBA because each of these mountain ranges that we survey, each of these five mountain ranges is a separate important bird area. So here's the data for, for 2022. And the total is 121. We had 121 trogons in 2022 of Southeast Arizona, as far as our survey captured. There may have been a few more that came a bit later, but we go with the same dates every year. So for this year's survey, it was 121. So what I have is on this spreadsheet, which I do share sometimes with researchers or with Game and Fish or anyone who's, who's interested. It's, it's more of a coordinating organize, data organizing sheet. But I do have this fun tab at the front which is where we put, we've been keeping track. We update this every year and keep track of our data the whole 10 years that we've been doing these surveys and we'll continue to add to it for the future. So from 2013 was our first year and I've always been a little trepidatious to show this out in the general public since the first, I'd say three to four years of surveying, it took us a while to sort of get our feet under us and to do these surveys really effectively, where we knew where all the best routes were. We knew the routes that absolutely had to be surveyed each time. Um, volunteers, as they did it year after year, got really good at doing the survey. So it, I, I think there's a, a couple years of lag. So these kind of lower numbers at the beginning, 97 to sort of 130, 134, um, I'm not sure exactly how accurate that is since 
we had a little bit of struggles. Now, one of the things I've been tracking as well is how many routes and how many participants we've had. So this little chart here that I add to every year shows that we did sort of have a dip in both routes run and people, um, although still 89 surveyors helping that year, the low is 89. So that's pretty darn good in terms of number of people helping with the survey. But it's been kind of up and down, but it's been still relatively consistent. And it's especially evened out towards, towards the end here from 2018 on. So any data fluctuations we're seeing, especially 2018 on, or I'd argue even probably 2016 on, is, is not so much a relic of effort, but of what the birds are doing. And that's why we keep track of that, because that's a question we get a lot. Um, you can see here, here's my little table showing how it's been going for the, um, the last 10 years. And you can see there's been, it, it kind of evened up. And so from 2013 to 2016, it was anywhere between 100 and 135. But then starting in 2017, the numbers started going up and we weren't really adding tons of routes or anything. So I think the number of trogons was increasing. So in 2018, it was 183. You can see it by mountain range too. Um, and then in 2019, 168, 2020, all time high of 201 elegant trograms, which is pretty great. That's a really high number. But then 2021, last year's survey, conditions were very, very poor. Anyone who helped with that survey, I'm sure noticed how brown and crunchy the landscape was. It was very, very, very dry. And we're going to talk about that. And we had 60 out, 68, our all-time low happened in 2021. And then this year's uh, data showed a pretty nice recovery, higher than I thought it was going to be, actually, up to 121. So it'll be very interesting to see what we get in 2023. I think it'll go, if conditions hold out, we had a really good monsoon this year. If we get any winter rain, you know, if the conditions are good spring of next year, we could have maybe even be approaching that high of 200 again, so 201. So it's very interesting to look at this, and it's especially interesting to look at it in the context of monsoonal rainfall. So I have these cool little maps, and these are put together by the University of Arizona, and they are showcasing monsoon moisture, and they're displaying it visually. And these are very cool. Once I figured out how these maps worked, they're actually extremely interesting to look at. And um, there's a website and I'll, you know what, in the, when I send the email with the recording and I'll put it in the description of the video too, there's a, the link to see, they have these going back into like the 1980s, these maps U of A has created. They're really cool to look at and they all look like this. They show Arizona, New Mexico, most of New Mexico and a tiny bit of Texas. So what this is telling us is with colors, it's showing us where monsoonal rainfall fell and in comparison to the average amount of precipitation normal for a monsoon. So between June 15th to September 30th is how these maps work. Uh, that's the, the official monsoon period. How much rainfall fell in each of these geographic areas and how does it compare to the, the average monsoonal rainfall? So white means it's at 100%. White means they got an average amount of rainfall. Green, as you start heading into lighter and then into darker shades of green that's showing that it's between sort of i'd say like 125 percent up to about 250 percent for very dark green so if you get if you see an area that's very dark green it got more than double the amount of average rainfall precipitation in that year's monsoon and then you start getting up into blue and you're up to like you know 280 up to nearly 400 percent so that'd be like a tremendous amount of rainfall so white is not bad white is good i mean that means they got the average amount which is which is which is good you know and then brown but then they have a number uh, excuse me a color going below so the darker brown you see is below average so very light brown means maybe slightly below like this sort of like kind of peachy color here this kind of light tan is a little bit below average, but you start getting into dark brown and you're getting close to zero, zero precipitation. So here's 2018. And it looks like Southeast Arizona did pretty darn well. Um, the Catalinas north of Tucson looked like they got a lot, maybe double the average. Everything else in the area is pretty much white into pale green. So everyone was getting sort of average into a little bit above average monsoon. That's great. Now, when we're thinking of monsoon, so this is the 2018 data, but this happens, you know, June 
in mid-June through September. The Trogon surveys are in May. So looking at these maps, and then when I look at the data, I'm really thinking of monsoon, the monsoon the year before really seems to be a very relevant statistic. Now, I think the monsoon the year of their breeding is incredibly relevant as well in terms of how how it went for them, how their reproduction happened. So we do the surveys in May because the trogons arrive in April, usually kind of mid, early to mid April. And by May, they're sort of all here, they're sorting out their territories and they are calling a lot. The males are calling a lot by then and they are courting females. They may have already paired with females. Some of them arrive paired, I was just reading. Uh, but they're usually not quite nesting by May. They, they, they usually lay eggs in June. The majority, there's a lot of variability, but they often lay their eggs in June. And then they really depend on monsoonal moisture to create all those insects that they use to feed the young. And then when the babies are out of the nest, they need lots of insects around for those, those fledglings to, to hunt, to learn how to hunt. The parents still feed them. But to teach them how to hunt, they need bugs kind of everywhere for these little babies to be trying to catch. So the monsoon, I'm sure, has a huge effect on their nest, um, nesting success, how well it goes for them. Huge effect. But in terms of our count for May, the data, I think, is going to heavily rely on how well the monsoon was the year before. Because the trogons, when they arrive in April, what they're going to see is how, what the habitat looks like from the monsoon the year before and any winter rain we may have gotten. So looking at this, this map one more time. So here's, here's 2018. 2018 was very good rainfall. And the year of 2018 data was quite high. It was 183, did quite well. That was good. And 2018 and leading into 2019, it went down to 168. Now that's really interesting. I'd have to look at the winter rainfall for that and see, see what happened there but still pretty steady, relatively steady. That's good. Now let's look at the next year's monsoon. Just let me advance. Yes. Okay. So here's 2018. Now here's 2019. 2019, you're seeing a lot more brown, especially in the Northern part of this map. That's, that's unfortunate for this part of the state, but looks like Southeast Arizona did like sort of okay. Like it was, it's paler down here. We got a little more rain than the Northern, than the Northern part of the state, but still not not great right so it's it's sort of average in some places below average in many places uh looks like the area between along i-10 here between tucson and phoenix was way below average but but you know not not terrible i mean not great not terrible so here's 2019 looking at the data so that would have led into 2020 but it was really quite high we had a huge amount of trojans that was our high count so obviously conditions were pretty good. It does seem like trogons are increasing generally in this area, more and more coming up from, from Mexico, sort of increasing their, their breeding presence up here. Now we have to understand too about elegant trogons. We are the most Northern extent of a breeding range that goes through most of West Mexico. So it's a very large breeding range to Mexico, but we are kind of the very top of that. And so you sort of get these pioneers that come up here. And I think settle up here and this population has just been growing and growing as they have successfully nested so the young that were born up here likely return to this area to nest themselves so as this population has done well the number of individuals coming up here to breed has increased that's my take on what's going on here but then so here's 2020 it was the highest ever um that may have been a tiny a tiny artifact of participation since it was our most surveyed ever it was huge 2020 was the highest number we ever had of people helping it's really great because everyone wanted to to help in may of 2020 and get out of the house and go out into beautiful nature and look for trogons it was a lot of fun and we found a lot it was great we there was a lot of trogons to be found now 2021 our all-time low is interesting to look at in terms of the map so here's the participation for 2019 now the monsoon of 2020 which many of you will remember was terrible uh, this is the one that a lot of people refer to as the non-soon. Articles were written about this. It was a huge deal. We all suffered through it. It was really bad. It was very, very low rainfall, tr tremendously brown map. When I looked at all these maps from the 1980s on, this was the brownest map that was in the, um, the set. It is 
zero to 25% maybe of mon normal monsoon moisture fell through most of the state and in Southeast Arizona. Let's say Southeast Arizona did a tiny bit better than the rest of the state, but it was still incredibly low. So this was in 2020. So I don't know how all those trogons, that 201 count, all those trogons that showed up, I bet a lot of those nests failed would be my guess. Now we definitely saw some, I had some reported juveniles that people were seeing <clears throat> in like the, the monsoon time of 2020, not very many. And I think a lot of those trogons either decided not to nest or failed at nesting because it was a terrible summer. And we also had a really rough winter too. Winter rains were very low later in 2020. And it was the 12 driest months on record in Southeast Arizona. When you look at June of 2020 to June of 2021, it was the driest 12 months on record in Southern Arizona. So it was really bad conditions by you know May of 2021. The conditions were terrible. Uh, it looked so dry. The oak trees were all brown on the hills of the Patagonias. It was really bad. So it's really not that surprising that 2021, right at the tail end of that drought, um, it finally broke in July of 2021. But you know, May of 2021 was right at the the, the tail end of this sort of the, this really long running, you know, year long drought. The conditions were awful. There was no insects anywhere, and then we had a very low count, our lowest ever, 68. So I've wondered if trogons who are migrating north through West Mexico, because this drought also hit extreme Northwest Mexico, sort of the sky islands of Northwest Mexico as well. They were also experiencing the exact same drought we were. And trogons moving up, moving north from West Mexico, I encountered those conditions in Northwest Mexico or even into Arizona and probably stopped or turned back even. So I think that's the reason for the low count birds that were feeling the migration push that were moving north decided to just skip that year and not make the effort to come all the way far that far north to breed if there's no food around so very low condition very low uh, number so let's look at what happened in the monsoon of 2021 so here's 2020 and here's 2021 wow we got a lot of rain so coming out of this 12 month drought the lowest you know, the driest 12 months on record in Southeast Arizona, we had one of the most gangbusters monsoons of all time happen that same year. So that was kind of hard on the land for sure that to have so much rain coming right after so much drought. Um, the desert took a beating. I definitely saw a lot of Saguaro's topple out in the wildlands in the Sonoran Desert for being so deprived of rain and then getting like almost too much. <laughs> I think that really killed off some saguaros they like sucked up too much and fell there's a lot of impacts from that but one of the big impacts is that the sky islands got a ton of rain so almost nowhere in the state was below average it was white to green into blue so blue is three to four hundred percent normal monsoonal rainfall so a tremendous amount of rain came into southeast arizona in, in the monsoon period of 2021 and for sure that had an impact on what happened this year so this is a pretty big increase. I feel like 121 over 68, that's a lot higher than I thought. I thought the numbers would take much longer than that to recover. It does seem like there was some, and I'd had people looking in 2021 after our, our low count of all time. I did have people checking because then of course we had this low count of all time in May and then July comes and we have a huge amount of monsoon. So I wondered if maybe some trogons arrived later in the season because it's been documented, they can be quite variable. They will sometimes nest late if conditions favor that. Um, we've seen babies as late as October in some of the areas of the atascosis. I mean, like young fledglings out of the nest. People have reported that to me. So I did have some people checking and there were there was a lot of sort of unofficial data coming in that people were seeing trogons in areas in the monsoon of this parts of the Sky Islands that we had very few to zero during the May survey. Now I can't add that to the data since we're trying to keep everything consistent, but just sort of as a footnote, it does, it, there may well have been trogons that showed up during the monsoon of 2021. And perhaps that contributed to this kind of stunning upswing for 2022. This is really quite, quite fast, I think. So for 2022, for birds to be nearly doubling the number that we counted in, in, um, in May of this year, 
is pretty breathtaking. It'll be really interesting to see what happens next year. So let's see what happened for the monsoon this year. So here's, here's last year's monsoon 2021, which really, I think contributed to this extreme recovery, very quick recovery, you know, uh, not recovery, but upswing in numbers. So this map has not been finalized yet for 2022 since it's not yet September 30th, which I, I suspect when they, they make these nice archive maps that they keep. But um, so here, here it is for so far in this year. So I'll put this link in the follow-up email as well, but this is a really cool, it's like a sister link to the, the one where you can get all the archive maps. This is a link where you can see the maps in real time. So as the monsoon's going on in Southeast Arizona, these maps from U of A update automatically every day and you can see how it's been going sort of so far in in arizona so this one uh, was june 15th to september 11th when i when i saved this map and so far so good right this monsoon's looking pretty darn good um white in much of sort of the tucson area south which means average monsoon that's good Lots of green, lots of blue, especially in the western part of the state. So we, we saw those previous maps, some of the darkest brown areas were these western parts of Arizona. So it's pretty great that in 2022, they got a lot of rain. So that's pretty cool. So it's been a good monsoon so far this year. I think that will have a huge impact on the data next year. Um, and we will see how that goes. But this, I thought it'd be kind of fun just to see the sort of inner workings of how all this data is archived as, and this is a Google sheet. So this is actually saved to the cloud. And so it's nice, nice, safe um, archive of this data. And every year we just add a new tab and all the data going back is in here. So it's pretty, pretty useful resource that's been growing over time. So, all right, let's see what else do I have here? Whoops. All right, so let's look at the map too. And the map is, is um, oh, oh, I just want to show you this cool little graph I made. All right, here's this graph showing the trogon counts, mountain range by mountain range and how they've fluctuated over time. So it's right in the middle. Blue is Atascosas, where it dipped, then went up, then dipped a little bit and then plummeted for 2021, but on the rise back up to 2022. Santa Rita's has been consistently going up. They all plummet in 2021, but each color is a mountain range. So red Santa Rita's, Yellow is Patagonia's, green is Huachuca's, and this darker orange is Chiricahua's. But you can see sort of the general trend has been increasing with this crash dip in 2021, but then sort of back up. So as we get perhaps another 10 years worth of data, that will hopefully expand out and it'll just be sort of a, a blip in the data, very explainable by the 12 driest months on record in Southeast Arizona. So that's a cool little, little graph I made. So, all right. So here's the map of the, I do a different map. Unlike the spreadsheet where they build on itself over time, we do a fresh map every year. So the maps are kind of archived one for each year. So all the routes are in here. So this moves over from year to year. We, we copied this over as, as well as improve it every year. Cause those are the, the routes that we use to organize the surveys. So people know where the heck they're going. But here's all the data. So 2020 data, and you can sort of look at it visually. So this is available online. Anybody can do this and zoom in themselves and see what happened. So the, the routes are in here as little lines, the places people survey. And when there's a sighting, you can see much of the information. I do omit a little bit of the data because I, I know this is public. So I don't put people's email addresses in here. I don't, there's certain things I just don't include in the spreadsheet we use to make the map. So some details, some surveyor details are deleted. But if there was an eBird checklist, there's a link to it, the name of the person, the date and all that, that's all, you know, standard. And then um, any comments they made. So the coordinates are there and then there's any notes. So if they're talking about, oh, I saw this or this behavior, it's all right here in the map. You can go check it out and they're all in here. So any information I got from people is here. So, um, so this one, so if they're double counts, I make them gray. That's how I do it myself. So I, I know what I'm doing when we're finalizing the data. And that's why we have to finalize the data too, because as the data comes in as raw data, you can't just release that because there may be some birds missing. There may be some data that came in as an email to me. There may be uh, birds that surveyors who didn't see each other. When you look at the map, it's very clear they probably saw the same bird. So it does take some um, proofing and really see all this cool information on what people saw. Coin call herd, bird, 
was not seen, but assumed to be male due to call. So that kind of, it's kind of fun to see that information. And you can look at this range by range. So this is the Atascosas, our furthest west mountain range, and also the lowest elevation of the five that we survey. The next, we always do the Patagonias, kind of mid-May, that usually the sort of second to last weekend of May, we do the Atascosas and the Santa Ritas. And the Patagonias, or excuse me, the Patagonias and the Santa Ritas. The Patagonias had a very low count this year. There wasn't that many. I think this area was hit very hard in the 2021 drought and is still recovering. So we had we had some along Harsha, not nearly as many as we usually have. Patagonias, I think, are still in recovery mode. There's also been quite a lot of disturbance in this area due to mining activity. So Oya had some up Corral, um, Corral Canyon. And you can see the little notes and all that. So that's really quite fun. This is a fun thing to look around at. And um, if you're interested to see what's going on, um, the Santa Rita's are famous for elegant trogons. Madera Canyon is in a very reasonable way, very famous. A lot of trogons in there. Some of these sightings are very close together. But when I reviewed Ebert data as well, it really seemed like they were separate sightings. It was a, it was a few we took out as double counts, but even though they look kind of packed in here, trogons really pack in the Madera Canyon. But there's also some in other parts of the mountain range. So Gardner Canyon and um, Cave Canyon. We had a lot of them in um, Josephine Canyon. This is an area that's very difficult to reach. We have a amazing hiking group that does this every year and gets really, really good data. And they do the same route every year too. So it's nice and consistent. Uh, we had an absolutely fearless person go up Temporal Gulch and got some trogon data that's a very difficult one to access but trogons like it and uh santa rita's did did well did very well this year um which is nice because they did get a lot of rain too so it kind of makes sense the wachucas is always the highest count and has was again this year over 50 trogons found and each year too we do try to refine the routes improve them maybe add a few more if we have enough volunteers survey maybe some of the less likely areas but you never know if you find trogons there then we'll do it again the next year uh so we did have some routes that were surveyed that don't have any result or just we didn't find any trogons had results zero is a very important number and how you know that happened is when you're looking at the maps we put a little gray dot and that means so this is the information of who surveyed it the fact that they did survey it the inf they did look and all that, but but they didn't find any trogons. And that's very important to document. So if you see routes that don't have trogon data, don't have trogons shown, and don't have um, you know, a gray dot for a negative result, that just means that route wasn't surveyed. So this one was, right? So this one has a gray dot. So it was surveyed by Chris and they didn't find anything. But there's notes and comments about maybe other things they saw or, or whatever. So that's how you read these maps is um, gray dot means it was surveyed with zero trogons. And if there's trogon icons, then they were found. I do color code them. So reds are males. Um, these orange ones are pairs. Uh, I usually do purple is female. Yeah, purple is female. So they're, they're color coded little trogon faces. And let's look at the famous Chiricahua. So this is a, by far the furthest east one we do. This mountain range is very famous for trogons because back in the day, it just had a reputation for being a great place to see trogons, but I don't, I, it seems like looking historically at trogons a hundred years ago, there were very few in Southeast Arizona. And this really was one of the most likely spots to go get them. Even 60 years ago, there was really not that many trogons in Southeast Arizona and South Fork was the place that people went to go see them. So it's, it's pretty well-known spot for trogons but it does not really ever even approach the highest count. So, but South Fork certainly does have a lot of turnarounds and it's a beautiful place to go survey. We get a lot of local help for this one. So here's South, South Fork of Cave Creek, famous birding location. It's really beautiful. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. It's really nice. And we had a lot of turnarounds in there. We did have one on what's known as North Fork of Cave Creek as well, another beautiful area. And this is all in the area near the town of Portal. So this is on the east side of the Chiricahua's. I did have some surveying happen on the west side of the Chiricahuas in Rucker. Rucker is kind of the most likely canyon that trogons would occur on the west side. Um, so we do check that every year. And if we have enough people, we check some of these other canyons as well. That did not happen this year, but they, al they almost always turn up zero. So I try not to waste people's time too much. It's good to check them. And if I have enough people, I will. 
but we always check Rucker because that is, if they're going to be anywhere on the west side, it'll probably be there. Okay. So um, another thing I thought would be fun is I came across this re, uh, the other day when I was looking up something else about Trogons. And when you, when you Google elegant Trogon popular, this little Google thing rises to the top, like this little pullout, which I thought was really kind of fun. That elegant Trogons are one of the most sought after birds by bird watchers in the United States. That's what Google says. I would definitely agree with that. But I think that was really fun that we spend so much time with these trogons and and it's so such a delight and so fun to see them. But everyone else wants to see them too. They're really very cool. And they are definitely a headliner bird for the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival. And they're definitely a huge part of our birding economy of Southeast Arizona. So the science of why we survey them makes a tremendous amount of sense and the fact that each of the five different places we survey for them is an important bird area makes it a flagship survey of the Arizona IBA program and Game and Fish is also very happy that we monitor these trogons since this is really the only consistently consistent breeding population in the United States it is very much in their wheelhouse to be monitoring such a rare bird in the United States and, and uh, monitoring that breeding population. So it's a win-win for everyone. And it's so much fun to go out and do these surveys as exhibited and captured in the following photo album. So I did a Google album and shared it widely with anyone who participated in the survey. If you volunteered for the 2022 Elegant Trogon Survey, and want to submit some photos, but haven't been able to, there's a few people I wasn't able to add to this album in a, in a capacity that allowed them to add photos since Google has some weird rules and doesn't like certain email addresses. Um, but if, so there's a couple people I wasn't able to add. If that was you or you couldn't figure it out and you want photos added, go ahead and email these, email them to me and I can add them for you. But we had a lot of really fun photos added. So people had really cool other species encounters we have here um, like black vulture and turkeys and uh, vermilion flycatcher. You can also comment on other people's photos. I wanted to just sort of show this on one. So here's a vermilion flycatcher from um, Melissa, right? It was, yeah, Melissa Fratello. And if you look at the comments, you have to go to this sort of little comment window on the bottom right. You can see what they wrote. And it says vermilion floof from Melissa Fratello. And that's exactly what that bird is. He is a little floof, little, little floofy bird. So I zoom this in so you guys can see them, but there's really cool lizard photos, some uh, landscapes, beautiful landscapes. I recognize this spot. This is um, in the Atascosas. This is right near Peña Blanca Canyon from Rachel. So a beautiful view of this really beautiful rock right here at the Peña Blanca Canyon. Uh, let's see here. Some cactuses growing. Oh, I, I did this. I think that was, oh, isn't that one of those Santa Cruz beehive? Yeah, I don't know, just a beautiful little cactus growing here out of this rock some selfies some other cool birds people saw so jay got a really cool um summer tanager so you can just everyone should have access to this uh folder i did have a view only option link in the results page as well on the arizona iba website here's a uh death pipe that's been covered with a rock by olia capping a death pipe excellent good job olia they keep those birds out of those pipes they cannot escape from I love how people put uh, notes on it. So Olya encountered a red tail nest with the mama peeking out at her. It's pretty cool. And lots of course, Trogon pictures as well, but you know, chats and a oh, beautiful, this is one of the better spotted toby pictures I've ever seen anywhere. A beautiful photo from Ryan, um, brown creeper and flicker and red face warbler and people taking pictures of their campsites i love this I especially love these human photos these really sort of context photos so bob and susanna setting up their camp to survey in a remote location butterfly photos and squirrels and flowers and more trogon photos see this is the sort of trogon photos i take like through a scope or binoculars i get a lot of photos like this too but you can really tell that's a trogon even in this photo through looks like a pair of binoculars works really well here's a little a little doggy companion helping with the survey it's little rue rue's a, a staple here around tucson Ottawa. it's a uh, kim meshashino's little puppy really nice trogon photos too look at this nice one from ryan it's beautiful wow 
So such elegant, beautiful birds. But we're going into the Sky Islands in May, you see amazing things. So it's beautiful claret cup cacti, more trogon pictures. This is from Kirsten, who's also on staff. So here's a nice trogon sitting in a sycamore tree. And here's a one with showing where the nest is, active nest, lower of the two holes. So that's nice documentation. Uh, more trogon photos. So here's a female near, is this a nest, Olia? That you, this is near her nest hole? Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. And we got some lovely scenery shots here. Some more, some more photos of teams, which is really fun. Oh, this um, little succulent growing right out of a rock from Sue. Beautiful butterfly and flower photos. This looks like maybe grass flowers. I don't think Sue's here, but yeah, it looks, looks like maybe grass flowers with a little butterfly. This is some, this is probably the best trogon photo I managed to get this year. You can't, of course, the stick right over his face, but pretty good photo. You can see his little like whiskers. I love how they have these little whiskers when you get a really good look at them. Uh, let's see here. And then some lovely scenery from Jay. It was just like a waterfall. It looks like, a, oh no, this is a rock narrow that they have to travel through. It's a snake. Oh, look at this photo Troy got. Look at that beautiful snake. Arizona Ridge nosed rattlesnake. What a beautiful. I've never even seen one of those. I've seen photos of them, but that's beautiful from Troy, Troy Corman, who did, uh, I believe, Sunnyside on the Wachukas. And there's Troy there. And uh, who will be at the upcoming AZFO meeting with me. If anyone, we'll plug for AZFO if anyone else is going to the Arizona Field Ornithology meeting in Safford. Nice photo of a sulfur belly flycatcher, a little nest. Oh, it's lovely scenery. Here's a, a trogon hiding in the undergrowth, which you is how I often see them. It's a little, uh, looks like a maybe a vireo. Oh, this is a photo I got really with my phone only. You could barely see it, but it was such a crazy encounter. Now, in fact, I'm going to kick off the encounters part right now. So then we'll unmute everyone in a moment if anyone else wants to pitch in. But I was in South Fork because I usually do all five surveys. I was in South Fork and that's in the Chiricahuas. And I was in my route, which we call um, Cypress Canyon. It's pretty much kind of halfway down South Fork. And the water was flowing there through South Fork. And I was sort of sitting for a moment. It was a nice spot to sit there among the rocks and like listen for trogons. And I saw a movement off to my right. And I look in this trogon, you can barely see it. It's right here. So here's the wing. It's a male. Here's that, that pale gray and the wing right here. Here's his dark head. Here's his tail coming down. Because I literally had only a moment. So I literally took a photo with my phone and zoomed in as far as I could. And it was kind of dark. It was kind of an undergrowth right near the water. This trogon was sitting really low, right over the water. And he splashed down for a second to like get a drink and then went back up. I'd never seen a trogon drink. And when I looked it up, there are some documented cases of trogons seen drinking from water, but that was really cool. I just saw he just splashed down for a second. I got a drink and then flew back up. It's a terrible photo, but I put it in because it was such a fun experience. And here's where I was here, South Fork. So the water's flowing. It's beautiful. It's really, really nice in there. I bet it's beautiful in the fall. There's a little bit of the walls of the canyon peeking through. Really beautiful spot. Um, so, Olya, oh yeah, let's go ahead and unmute everybody and see if anyone has anything they want to share. Or maybe yes, so they would have to unmute themselves. Um, yeah. But I can kick off the, the encounters while, you know, we're all kind of thinking of our stories. I always enjoy surveying the same route for you know the different ranges and like seeing how different the years are between uh, our surveys and seeing how I am finding trogons almost in the exact same spot every yeah. single year and that's the territory that they keep coming back to and one area that I especially like is the Corral Canyon in Patagonia's and usually, you know, I see the typical, you know, birds that you would see there. But this past year, I had a lifer at the very beginning of my route. Uh, it was a long-eared owl. So it was um, something really exciting right at the beginning. And, you know, other birds also make this survey experience really, really fun. And, you know, Corral Canyon is really, really good for the trogans as well. I've had up to three pairs in really good years up there. So one of my favorites. So it's always good to get out there and see what we can find. That's excellent. Thank you, Olya. Yeah, I always like how you do the, the corral 
canyon. That area is beautiful. If anyone wants to go birding in a cool area that you haven't maybe been to before, it, you can get it's forest land. It's it's open to the public. It's in the Patagonias on your way to the San Rafael Grasslands. So if you've ever driven out to San Rafael, you pass Corral Canyon on your right without maybe realizing it. There's no signage or anything. But looking at our Trogon results map gives you a good sense of how to get there. And if you need better directions, let me know. It's also in our book, Finding Birds in Southeast Arizona, how to find the entrance to Corral Canyon. It is so nice in there. It is so nice. And even in the fall, I mean, there's Eastern bluebirds in there. There's Trogons. It's just tons of birds. It's a really beautiful drainage. So if you're looking for a rugged adventure spot, that's a really, and it's not even that right. It's not that hard to get to. I mean, you're on a dirt road. And you can just either park off that or you can go down this dip into sort of an unofficial parking area a little bit lower down. But um, if you're looking for kind of off the beaten path areas, really, really nice in there. All right. Does anyone else who's here want to want to say anything or, or share anything with the with the group? We did have a couple comments here from the Conrads about um, the Chiricalas in having fledglings. Did oh, you excellent. Want to make a comment on that at all? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. How do I, why am I, everything, I am in charge of this Zoom meeting. I'm usually not the host. So everything looks a little bit different than what I'm used to. I cannot find the, the oh, there it is chat. Okay. All right. Uh, Cause it's showing me stuff. I don't usually see like participants. Okay. Um, fledglings here in this year. How oh, was September and October, 2021? Excellent. See, that's, that's really good to know since 2021 was that that real crash year but then followed by a tremendous monsoon i really suspected stuff like that was happening i had people going back monthly and checking the same areas of the santa rita's like the same route uh, we did this in gardner canyon and things like that were really helpful too to get it and, and more trograms did seem to show up in the santa rita's and this specific route that was checked several times throughout the monsoon into like september um and that's really interesting that you guys had fledgings that is great and then um i do believe we got that into the data too laura i think so that's but yeah i, I had forgotten about that that's really good so two nests of three each so yeah like a almost like a little boom coming out because of that really good monsoon so the, the, those 68 programs that showed up were not wrong them sticking around or, or at least you know showing up in may and staying long enough for the count turned out to be a good move since we did have a good monsoon after that. I suspect more birds came up after May as well. And they were rewarded with a really good monsoon. But if it had been a terrible monsoon, they may have been in real trouble. So it's an interesting gamble that birds have to make when you're a migrant. Um, also, 2020 was a strange year. Yeah, the ear Quetzals in the Chiricahuas. I was really hoping those were going to turn up again this year. 2020 was a really interesting year for a lot of reasons. But the birding in Southeast Arizona was also very interesting. And then they spent four months in the Chiricahuas. I did get to go see those birds. They were really cool in the Chiricahuas. Really interesting, really cool birds. And um, Tim has a comment here. Really like this map way of presenting the data. It is really helpful compared to a database. And I think the two in tandem work great together. I think the map is probably what I end up sharing the most with the public. Um, and it is really helpful in just getting a sense visually of how the birds cluster geographically it's it's really pretty cool oh that's false indigo the, the plant we were looking at with the butterfly on it and the um let me go back to that okay so come. i saw tim also unmuted himself did you oh okay excellent so go ahead tim i'm going to share my screen real quick and show that false indigo but um tim would you like to say anything yeah i was just going to add one comment and um, that was you and uh, Olya are both aware of what I've been doing with the eBay analysis and the, excuse me, the uh, eBird analysis and the drought. Uh, one nice thing is you worry about that data, how much bias is in the eBird data, but this is the best ground truthing we have of it because when you look at the eBird for this same period, you saw that in the down year, we lost two thirds to three fourths of the eBird observations but then they came up to about half. And that's tracking almost exactly with what you're seeing on your survey. So I think it gives us a lot of confidence when we look at what the eBird is saying about a lot of these other birds and how they responded to the drought as well. That is fascinating, thank you. And what Tim's referring to too is, is his, his really, really cool work looking at how drought conditions have tracked with eBird data. That's be across all species in Southeast Arizona. And um, 
there was a really well done by Tim blog post recently on the uh, Tucson Audubon blog about this. Was it one blog post or was it two, Tim? There were two, two, two different ones. Thought. So definitely, if you're interested in this concept, and it is fascinating to look at, go ahead and take, you know, I would go look up those two really good uh, blog articles Tim did. And um, and this information will also be available at the upcoming Arizona Field Ornithologist meeting in September. Is that right, Tim? You're going to be doing a poster on that? Yeah, I printed that out. So I'm excited to show that and get some feedback. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. And this is just such an interesting brave new world we're in where because of things like eBird and these large survey efforts like the Elegant Trogon survey, but eBird is like impossibly large. It's just so many people contribute. You can have such big data to look at trends for these sort of big picture concepts like regional drought. So it's fascinating and, and great work with that, Tim. Just really fascinating stuff. All right. Would anyone else like to like to say anything for for the about your, your Trogon experience or just your survey experience? All right. Well, it's really good comments and wonderful photos that everyone shared. So I really appreciate, you know, everyone. It was a huge number of people that helped with the, the 2022 Elegant Trogon Survey of Southeast Arizona. And it's been a tremendous number of people that have helped over the last 10 years. I really should figure out how many people, how many like individual people, I have it year to year, but, you know, take out the duplicates. How many, how many separate people have helped over 10 years? I bet it's like, if I had to guess. 250 to 300 different people have probably helped would be my guess but we'll see i'm going to crunch the data and see but it's been just so marvelous coordinating this survey it's there's a lot of moving parts but we get so much really cool data and we all get so much fun field time and really we could not do this survey without you it's a tremendous amount of sort of man hours out in the field and the result is this wonderful data set we have of 10 years that's going to just keep continuing to grow into the future. I also am going to give sort of a little sneak, sort of a spoiler sneak peek shout out. Watch for the next issue of Tucson Audubon's newsletter, The Vermilion Flycatcher. There will be an article about the Elegant Trogon surveys in there since this is the 10 year, the 10th year of us doing it. So 2013 was the first year and all the way to 2022 makes 10 surveys. So this is our, our 10th Elegant Trogon survey. So You'll see a little bit, uh, you guys got the sneak peek. No one's seen those those graphs and charts yet on the art before, you know, before today on that. So uh, they will be in the article as well, but uh, keep an eye out for that. And I just want to thank you all again so much for helping uh, with this survey effort. Thank you so much. All right.